I'm doing an SPS thing tomorrow. Yeah. Well, the thing is, we decided we wanted to have a real talk, but we didn't have anything. We just wanted him to talk about his life. Because he's an interesting man. Oh. We have those every now and then. Okay, so. so. <laughs> The negation of that is that I am not yeah. an interesting person. Yes. I was asked to speak about physics. I mean, like, would I you mean, speak about your yeah. life? Were I you mean, asked to speak about more trepidation. So, like, ah, uh, Flournoy is, like, I also serious about yeah. talking about physics all the time. We also gave Gabriel the option. Interesting. Oh, yeah, well, and it was very short notice. So we were like, hey, man, can we just really ask about Really, someone who will come hang out with us for an hour in two days. What are you doing right now, Dr. <laughs> I'm just, uh... Making sure I don't ask the same questions. Okay, we're getting started. What? No, I, I, the people that I asked questions of last time were on the top of the deck. Okay. Uh, so I, I was going to say, you better all be shut Okay, so um, let me throw a result up on the board to kind of see where we're going today. So we're in the process of trying to make a, a new and gooder derivative. Mm -hmm. And what we've discovered to this point is that uh, our new and improved derivative when acting on a tensor is going to take the following form. Okay, where we then have to append to this some terms that are non-tensorial and make use of what's called a connection. And we have to append one of these terms for each and every one of the indices of the original tensor. It comes in with a plus sign if the index is a vector index, and it comes in with a minus sign if the index is a dual vector index. And then the other various indices have to be assigned just so that everything makes sense. Okay, there's not a lot of flexibility in how you assign the rest of the indices. Um, you know, clearly this thing right here needs to have a mu. This has a mu, and a, a mu and a beta on the bottom, so every term has to have a mu and a beta on the bottom. So there's not a lot of flexibility in where you do that. You might come to this term and say, well, this, is the mu the first one or the second one? Does it matter if you interchange these two? We'll actually talk about that today. But uh, for the most part, it's, it's just getting all the indices to line up. Um, okay, so uh, what we want to do as our short-term objective is get an actual formula for these gammas in terms of things that um, we, would, we would start with. And then uh, we're gonna spend the rest of the time talking about how to interpret all of what's going on, okay? So this is actually a really, really nice uh, lecture um, because we actually get an idea of what, what's underlying all this formal machinery. And then once we have an idea of what's going on, we're gonna take it to the next step and say, okay, what else can we do with this new derivative? Because it turns out it's gonna play a very prominent role in this course. Um, so, there were six criteria that I said we wanted of our derivative, and we have, at this point, applied four of them. And having applied four of them got us here, and then it also got us to the transformation rule for the, uh, um, for the gammas. Um, and I'll just, I will remind you what it is. I'll probably write it down later, but we have the transformation rule for the gammas. And as promised, the gammas do not transform like a tensor. That's what we would expect. And now what we're going to do is we're going to apply the second two, or the, sorry, the last, of the, uh, the last two of the six conditions. Um, so the first thing I want you to do is I want you to suppose, now remember, at this point, I would argue there's quite a few uh, options for what the gammas actually are. There's, there's some freedom in exactly what those look like. They have to have certain properties that we've talked about, but there's still like a set of them that are possible. And what we're gonna do now is we're gonna weed that set down to one unique expression for gamma. Okay, so the first, first thing we're gonna do is that we're going to suppose we have two gammas and we take the difference. So this gamma twiddle is just, it's here, I'll, I'll give it a different name, uh, a gamma one and a gamma two. It's just, suppose we have two of the connections in this set of possible connections, and we consider just subtracting one from the other, okay? I'm going to argue very quickly that the difference of two of the connections is a tensor. Now remember, a gamma is not a tensor. 
It doesn't care. I'm going to write down the transformation just to remind you of how bad it is. So if I'm expressing the gammas in some new coordinate system, say a prime coordinate system, then we start with something that looks like a tensor transformation law. But then you get this non-tensorial piece. And the non-tensorial piece I really have to look at because it's not obvious because it's not tensorial. Okay, so gamma is not a tensor, but I'm going to argue to you that if you take two gammas and you subtract them, then the difference is a tensor. And the way we do that is pretty straightforward. Um, we can first of all just say del mu of a vector. That is the derivative, and this is our new derivative, the, the derivative of a vector is a tensor, right? That's the whole point of this story, is to make a derivative that actually gives us a tensor when we act on a tensor with it. So, if I take the derivative made with one of these connections and I subtract from it the derivative of the vector using the other connection, okay, so let us, uh, yeah, it's up here. Okay. A tensor minus a tensor should be a tensor, okay? I mean, just think about it, like if I transform this thing, I would have the, all those dx, 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 dx's. If I transform this, I would have all those dx, dx, dx's. But they would have the exact same set of dx, dx, dx's out front of each because they had the same indices. So I could factor out all of those dx, dx, dx's and have one big transformation of this difference. So the difference of tensors is a tensor. So this thing needs to be a tensor. But now let's actually blow up what these things are. Okay, so we have d mu v1 plus d, uh, or sorry, plus gamma 1 uh, mu lambda, uh, I'll just look at what I've got on my notes, I'll get this wrong otherwise, uh, lambda mu v mu, um, and then for this guy, minus d mu v lambda minus gamma built out of 2, uh, mu, nu, lambda, v, nu, okay? I'm just applying the definition of how the derivative acts on a vector to this guy, that's these terms, and then this guy, that's these terms, where I'm using the first gamma here and the second gamma there, okay? Now, very, very simple observation from my first victim, Daniel. Does anything here cancel? Yeah. yeah, no, that's, that's, that's just simple as. It's the same partial on each of those. So those cancel. But that then means that I have gamma 1 lambda mu nu minus okay. But this thing has to be a tensor. That's the whole argument that I'm starting with. Okay, so a vector is a tensor, so this thing itself has to be a tensor in order for this to have the overall tensor um, uh, form. Okay, so what we've discovered is that the difference of two connections is a tensor, and now that's important for the following reason. If we start with any form of gamma, then what we can do is we can consider the following tensor, t mu nu lambda, which is gamma lambda mu nu minus gamma lambda nu mu. Okay. This is also known as twice the anti-symmetrization of gamma lambda mu nu. So what we're basically doing is we're saying, if I have a connection, I can just form the difference of the connection with itself where I interchange the two lower indices. Yes? When you said that the difference between the connections is tensor, you just proved it with those parentheses and then acting on that 
the tenth on that vector. How is that proving that the first term is a tensor, not just it's acting on the vector as a tensor? Because uh, you're just saying tensor is equal to this product or this uh, difference. Well, I, okay, I, I should, yeah, I, I guess I should. Um, Uh, well, I guess I guess one could argue that the difference of two connections acting on anything, the connections in and of themselves, uh, just like stem. No, 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 no. Yeah, no. no the, the, this. Okay. So, if I were going to transform this expression into some new coordinate system, then it would, of course, look something like this: lambda prime mu prime mu prime minus gamma two, lambda prime mu prime mu prime v nu prime. Okay. Uh, I know how to express v nu prime in terms of the old uh, components. That's with the standard dx dx's, which we could just throw in here. Okay, and so then the question is, is all right, well, what does this have to transform with? And um, you argue over, over all, we know how this thing transforms, right? This thing would transform with a dx, 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 mu, 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 and if we're going to a new coordinate system, it would be mu prime in the bottom and mu prime in the top. And so whatever the overall transformation of this is, it has to be the same as the overall transformation of, of this thing, okay? Um, and... Would the, would the second term of like that top equation above what you just wrote just cancel? This guy? Yeah. Yeah, I guess, I guess that's, um, can, we, I don't, can we see it directly from there? Ooh. Um, let's, yeah, no, no, you're, you're, you're totally right. Yeah, you can just, you can actually see it directly from there. Yeah. Um, you can see it directly from here because the first term in the transformation actually depends on the connection itself. And the fact that you have two different connections means that this term will be different. But this has nothing to do with the connection you're picking. This is just, a, this is just coming from the transformation you're choosing. And you're doing one transformation on both of them, so these terms will cancel. That's a, that's a quicker way to see it. I've never actually done it that way, but yeah, it's an equally valid way to see it. Okay, so um, but at the end of the day, what I'm really interested in doing is taking one connection and forming the difference of the connection with itself with the indices interchanged. And and remember, this thing right here is defined as one half gamma lambda mu nu minus gamma lambda nu mu. That's the definition of this with square brackets. So multiplying it by two gives us exactly that. Okay. And so then what we can do is we can do something a trick that's often played in general, and that is given any connection, we can break it up into its anti-symmetric piece plus its symmetric piece. Okay, the round brackets just mean do the same thing except put a plus sign in there. It is trivial to, to, to replace this with this, replace this with the same expression with a plus sign, add everything up and you'll get this. Like that's one of the nicest exercises you could ask to do in a quantum course, for example. Okay, but here's the important part. A connection is non-tensorial. Okay, remember it's non-tensorial because it fixes the derivative. Remember we demonstrated this was not tensorial, so to make this tensorial we needed to fix non-tensorial by adding something non-tensorial. So this is really the important property. This is non-tensorial. The difference, the anti-symmetric piece, is tensorial. Okay? 
So going forward, what we can say is, if we just want to focus on the really important part of the connection, that is the non-tensorial part, we can ignore the anti-symmetric part of it. So if we focus on the part of the connection that is symmetric in the two lower indices, then we are applying what's called the torsion-free condition. Because this thing right here is the definition of what we would call the torsion tensor. So we can get away and we can do all of general relativity using a connection which is symmetric in the lower two indices, just like the metric is symmetric in the lower two indices. Okay. The reason we can do that is because we don't really get anything useful from the anti-symmetric part. And the argument I'm giving you here that kind of implies that is the anti-symmetric part is just a true tensor, so it's not doing the magic that a connection does for us. Now, in certain extensions of general relativity, for example, if you want to couple general relativity to spin, then you actually have to include the tensor, the torsion contribution to the theory, but that goes beyond Einstein's basic formulation of general relativity, which is gonna occupy us in this class. So the, the, the basic uh, thing we get after uh, applying condition E, which is basically that we wanna look at vanishing torsion, is that whenever I write down gamma lambda mu nu, it's symmetric in the lower two indices. That's the takeaway from this, okay? So torsion-free means symmetric in the lower two indices. And I'm going to use that extensively in what's about to happen. Any questions about that? Okay. So here we go. Let's get rid of this because the next part's going to be a little big. The next part is really, to me, it's kind of hilarious because this one little bitty statement ends up giving us the final form of the, of the connection. Okay. So condition, um, oh, that's so funny. How, how, how did I have that written? A, B, C, D, E. This is supposed to be condition F, and I have it listed as condition D because I'm crazy. Okay, so condition F is metric compatibility. That is, we want the metric to be, and there's a certain point in this discussion where I was supposed to say this word, and I, I just, I, I didn't find the right, I missed the moment to actually say it. So I'm now going to say it, and then I can just transition to it in the future. Um, we started with this derivative and said this is non-tensorial. So we replaced it with this derivative, which is tensorial. Okay? The idea that you're working with an object which is tensorial is called covariance. Covariance means that it transforms like a tensor. So the name that we actually give this derivative is the covariant derivative, alluding to the fact that it does in fact transform like a tensor. So going forward, I'm gonna call this the covariant derivative and that's what it's referred to in the literature, okay? So metric compatibility is the statement that the metric is covariantly constant. Now one, this, one needs to be careful because that does not imply constant. This is not the ordinary partial derivative, this is the covariant derivative. So in particular, it uses the partial plus, Christoph or plus connections. I'll come to those in a second, okay? <laughs> But this is basically the statement of metric compatibility. The metric is covariantly constant. And I'm going to give you interpretations of what covariantly constant means in a little bit. Okay? But this one single equation is where all the, the money comes from. So let's see how we would actually use this. Um, first of all, in terms of language, 
if we demand that the connection be metric compatible and we demand that it be torsion free, which we just, uh, we just demanded in the previous one, then we are led to a unique connection that's called the Christoffel connection. So going forward, I might refer to this as the Christoffel connection. Sometimes these are all also called the Christoffel symbols. People refer to Christoffel symbols. You don't want to call them Christoffel tensors because they're not tensors. So you got to put some word after them. Connection, Christoffel symbols. Um, okay. So um, in order to see where we're going to actually get something useful out of this, I'm going to do one of those things that seems largely unmotivated. Um, but some smart person at some point figured out, oh, I can get it this way, and they did this, and then they acted like they just uh, like figured this all out in their head while they were drunk one day. Um, but what we're going to do is we're going to write this one equation down three times. But in each iteration, I'm going to choose a different assignment of indices. So in the first iteration, I'm going to write it down with the indices being mu, rho, mu, and nu. Okay, so just to give you an idea, um, I'm basically writing this down and with these index assignments, so del delta rho, g, mu, nu. Okay. But I know how the covariant derivative acts on a tensor. Notice the metric has two dual vector indices, so that means I'm going to use two of the negative terms. Okay, so just filling in what this looks like. We're going to have the partial rho g mu nu minus gamma lambda rho mu g lambda nu minus gamma lambda rho nu g mu lambda. Okay. We always lead off with just a normal partial. And then the first term is basically taking care of the mu index. See, it's summed with the lambda. And then the second term here is taking care of the new index. Okay. And again, that's just applying the definition up here. Rem remember, this is written for one upper and one lower, but that you can generalize this to as many upper and as many lower as you need. You just keep adding these for all the vector indices and these for all the dual vector indices. Okay, so iteration number two is going to be in the mu, nu, rho order. So I'm going to stop talking and just write. Now, so far, I've literally just used the definition of the covariant derivative of the metric. Right? Just blown it up into its explicit expression. By saying I want the metric, I want the connection to be metric compatible, means that all of these should be equal to what? Zero. That's what metric compatibility means. So all of these should be equal to zero. Now I'm going to go and do one of those things which people hate. Man, it's so useful in this class. I'm going to do a little bit of index reassignment. Actually, I'm going to do some index swapping. So remember that by the assumption of torsion free, I can swap the two lower indices in the connection. So this can be written as row mu. And then, of course, the metric is symmetric as well, so I can interchange the two indices in the metric. 
If I come down to this term, I can do the same. And then if I come to this term, I can do the same again. Yes. Kyle. Kyle. It's an easy one, don't worry. Be good. This can be done in one of two ways. You can either do the left hand side or the right hand side. What I want to calculate is equation 1 minus equation 2 minus equation 3. You can either work with the left hand sides of the equations or the right hand sides. Your choice. The right hand. Oh man, that's lazy. No, what do you get from the right hand side? Zero. Zero, yeah, zero minus zero minus zero, zero, okay? Now, for those of you with a keen eye, you might be noticing that I did some smart things. Rho, mu, lambda, nu. Rho, mu, lambda, nu but I'm subtracting one minus equation two. So those are gonna cancel. Rho nu mu lambda, rho nu mu lambda, it's equation one minus equation three, so those cancel. Moreover, mu nu lambda rho, mu nu lambda rho, these two are just gonna add to twice one of them, okay? So altogether, what I have is that d rho g mu nu minus d mu g nu rho minus d nu g rho mu plus twice gamma lambda mu nu g lambda rho, that has to equal zero. That's some good stuff. Why is that good? If you, if, you, if you were in physics one and you could squint your eyes tight enough to, so that all the indices just kind of disappeared and you just thought of all the big symbols like G, gamma, two, G, derivative, derivative, derivative. And I said, solve this for gamma. You'd go, okay. Because it's one equation and gamma appears in one place and it's linear. Like literally, it's arithmetic to solve for gamma, okay? So we can take this, and I'll write it up here. We get the final form of our gamma. Gamma lambda mu nu is equal to, so I'm gonna move this to the other side of the equal sign. Uh, I'm gonna divide by a half, or I'm gonna multiply by a half, divide by two. Um, I need to get the met this thing on the other side so if I want to get the metric away from the connection and onto the other side of the equal sign, what do I multiply by? The inverse metric, right. I multiply by the inverse metric. So I can multiply this by, say, for example, G rho beta. And if I multiply this by G rho beta, <laughs> what am I doing? I'm crazy. If I multiply it by G rho beta times the original metric, then that product ends up becoming uh, lambda beta. So on this side, all it does is it takes the upper index of the connection and turns it into whatever I, symbol I chose there. And then on the other side, I get this factor of the inverse metric. Oh, and I, use, I actually chose sigma instead. Okay, so here we go. D mu G nu rho min plus D nu G rho mu minus D rho G mu nu. Okay.
And that is it. That is the final expression for the Christoffel connection. Remember, the Christoffel connection is unique. It takes into account all six of these properties, including among them metric compatibility, the fact that it's torsion free, and all the other things. Yeah, go ahead. Something not working out of my expression? No, I think it's fine. I was just curious. Is there a reason you chose those three particular orders of the indices? Like you did rho mu nu rather than rho nu mu? I, I, I realize it doesn't matter, but I don't think it matters. Uh, uh, three specifically. There's six combinations total. Is there a reason yeah. three in particular? You just you're just picking a set of the combinations where the the all of the First different percent. gammas will cancel. Okay. Um, there's actually probably, and I can't think of it right off the top of my head, but there's probably some underlying identity that assigns the order uh, tells you a particular combination of these of these permutations should give you a simple expression, but I can't remember what is off the top of my head. Yeah. I mean, I as long as the first indices of all of them are different, it looks like they're the exact same term if you just switch the last two indices. Because like, you can just transpose the metric and it's the same thing, so it doesn't matter. Yeah. The first term. I mean, this is probably not the only combination that okay. would work. Um, OK. So where was? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Here I am. OK, yeah, there I am. Look at that. OK, mm -hmm. so a couple of things to note about this. I give you a metric, g mu nu, in a set of coordinates. So I give you the x mu's that we're working with. That's all you need. You can construct this thing. Okay. Now I argued that this is not a tensor. How can you tell it's not a tensor from the right-hand side? Or what suggests that it's not a tensor from looking at the right-hand side? Let's pick a vector. Jason. Star Wars. How can you look at the right hand side of this and kind of get the idea that it wouldn't be a tensor? They don't have the answer. Don't even try to listen to them. They're crazy. Yes, good. To be a tensor, it has to transform like a tensor. Is G is the inverse metric a tensor? Yes. Yes. Is the partial derivative of the metric a tensor? No. No, exactly. The fact that the right-hand side uses only partial derivatives okay. and nothing else kind of is implying to you, hey, wait a minute, the partial derivative was the thing that was broken in the first place. Yeah. Okay. So, so it, it does reflect the fact that this thing is uh, not a tensor. Um, okay, uh, how many of these are there? If I asked you to calculate, if I gave you the metric and I said calculate the components of the Christoffel connection, how many different expressions would you have? Or how many different results would you have to calculate? Just in the raw, you don't have to take into account symmetries. Well, how many values does each of the mu, nu, and sigma take? Four. Four. And there are three of them. So how many are there? Six. <laughs> you guys can do this. Four times four is? Sixty-four. Four times four is not sixty-four. See, now you're acting all advanced. Like, I just going to answer the sorry, question and skip the intermediate question. Yeah, there's sixty-four of these. Okay? You're... I hope you are very quickly realizing that doing things by hand in this class is going to become impossible. Very soon we're going to look at something that has four indices. Yes. Okay, so if you're not at all comfortable with Mathematica, you better get that way this weekend. Okay, because we are going to start using Mathematica and the homework reasonably extensively in, in, in going forward. And I'm going to point you to a package to use to do that. You're not going to have to do the raw index gymnastics by hand. I'm going to give you a package. Uh, it's called the GREAT package, general relativity, and all that, something E and all that. Anyway, 
But it's pretty straightforward. You type in a vector of your coordinates, you type in the entries to the metric, and then you say calculate, and it calculates all the stuff you need. Yes? Do, you have, do we have to use Mathematica? You do not have to use Mathematica. I might not be able to help you if you use something else. But you can use anything you want. I'm not, it, I'm not checking your, your coding or anything. All right. Okay, so, um, so we've, got a, we've got an expression. We could calculate these things given a metric and a set of coordinates. Um, all right. And remember, if I, if I change coordinates, I, I have a new set of coordinates, I have a new metric, and in, in that new set of coordinates, I would also have a new expression for the gammas. And what's interesting is it all actually works out because if I gave you the new coordinates, then the derivatives would change. You could transform the metric and then calculate the right-hand side and get an expression for the connection. Or you could take the connection you started with and just use its transformation property and you would end up with the same expression. All the transformations have to lead you to the same place. Well, the single transformation has to lead you to the same result no matter how you actually calculate it. Okay, so this is all like super dry, super dry. That's like a clothing company, isn't it? Um, and now we really need to figure out what in the hell is going on. Because this is just, to me, it's totally uninspiring. So, bam, I erased a bunch of stuff that would have been useful. Oh, no, 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 I can rescue it. Okay, so this is... This is uh, T alpha. It's terrible. It's funny. I'm, my energy levels are going up, and I think it's because my headache is on is coming on, and so I'm trying to talk through my headache. This is going to hurt a little bit. Um, I think it was T alpha beta partial mu, and this is del mu T alpha beta. Sound like right? Yeah, good, awesome. Okay, so a couple of things that might surprise you. First thing that might surprise you, you have used these before. You have actually encountered and used the Christoffel connection before, though it was never named. <coughs> These are useful even in flat space. You don't necessarily have to be in the curved geometries of general relativity in order to need this machinery. They pop up in flat space. Okay. So I can uh, show you both of these through one example. So I want you to consider R2 and we're going to use polar coordinates in R2. Okay, so instead of x, y, we'll use R theta. We already know that the metric takes the form 1, 0, 0, R squared, and therefore the inverse metric has components 1, 0, 0, 1 over R squared. Okay, the line interval ds squared is dr squared plus r squared d theta squared. Okay. So now let's, uh, so this is our starting point. Now let's take this and say, okay, we've got metrics, we've got coordinates, we could ostensibly calculate our 64 Christoffel connections. Okay, so let's just kind of do that quickly in our heads. Okay, so using that, what we discover is the following, that the Christoffel connection associated with gamma r and theta theta in the lower is minus r. Don't, you're, you're not actually going to do this in your head, obviously. Um, and then we have that gamma theta r theta, which is of course equal to gamma theta theta r because of the symmetry in the lower two indices, that guy turns out to be 1 over r, 
And what's really nice is that all others equal zero. So most of our Christoffel connection components are zero, which you could kind of expect because this thing really, it only depends on R. R only appears in one term in the metric. So when you go through this chain of derivatives, the only ones that are ever going to matter are derivatives with respect to R, but you've got to be taking the derivative of the correct component of the metric. Okay. Now, this is, this is not obvious. It's not intuitive. You will have a homework problem this week, though, where you're going to take this definition and apply it to a di general diagonal metric and find some shortcuts to the calculation. Okay? So there are some shortcuts you can use where if I hand you a diagonal metric, then you can figure out the components reasonably quickly. I don't carry those shortcuts around in my head, to be honest with you. I don't carry anything around in my head, to be honest with you. Um, but you could just forgo that and just throw it all in Mathematica. You could open the Mathematica package, feed in the metric, feed in the coordinates, and then say calculate the Christoffel connection components, and it'll just give you the non-zero ones, and then the rest are zero. Okay? But anyway, so, so uh, all I'm saying is this result is literally just a straightforward application of that definition. Now, what would we do with it? Well, consider constructing the covariant derivative of a vector where I actually give the same index to the vector as to the covariant derivative. Now, we are in a purely spatial context. We're just in R2. There's no time. All right? So that is a context in which you've done a lot of vector calculus. So in a purely spatial context, what would you call this particular derivative? Nabla. <laughs> Nabla. <laughs> what would you call this operation on the vector? <laughs> on a vector. It's the divergence, exactly. This is, in, in more colloquial terms, just del dot v. Okay? And where this is literally just the del that you used in, in your E&M course. All right? Now let's write out what this is using our definition of how the covariant, or the covariant derivative acts on tensors and then what we know about our Christoffel connections. So first of all, this, this looks a little weird because I've got the same index in both places, and this definition uses one index here and a different index there. So what we can do is we can actually just use a delta function to contract the indices after the fact. And so I can construct this thing where I take the covariant derivative with respect to mu of v nu, then I can just apply this, and then afterwards just hit it with a delta function that makes mu and nu equal. And that will give us an expression for del mu v mu. All right, so doing that, we've got our delta function, and then we've got partial mu v nu, and then we've got a positive term coming from the Christoffel connection. Looks like that. Okay. And then now I can just distribute through my delta function. That's just going to take all the mu's and turn them into nu's. And now we can get pretty explicit with this, okay? So I have repeated indices here. That means I sum over the indices. My values are basically R and theta. I could call them 1 and 2, but I'll just call them R and theta because those are pretty intuitive. So this is going to give me dr vr plus d theta v theta. That's coming from just the partial. And then when I do this, Notice I have a double sum. I have the sum over v and I have the sum over lambda. Those are independent sums. So when I do that, what I'm going to have is when nu is equal to r and when lambda is equal to r, and then when nu is equal to theta, but lambda is equal to r, good lord, and then when gamma is equal to r, but lambda, or sorry, when nu is equal to r and lambda is equal to theta, and then finally when they're all equal to theta. Okay. That's what a term looks like if it has two double sums. Okay? We good? 
Sweet. All right. Now, uh, look at our results for the Christoffel components. Okay. Uh, this, these guys are zero. Uh, these guys are zero. This guy is not zero. And this guy is zero. So at the end of the day, what we get for our derivative is dr vr plus d theta v theta plus gamma, let's just plug in the value, gamma theta theta r is 1 over r. Okay? And so this is basically what we have for w mu. Now, how many of you have taken intermediate gamma? Okay, those of you who have taken intermediate gamma, this this expression should start smelling familiar. When you write down the divergence of a vector in polar coordinates, it's not the same. It's not as simple as the divergence in Cartesian coordinates. In Cartesian coordinates, the divergence is always super easy because it's literally just the, the derivative with respect to each rectangular coordinate times the corresponding component of the vector with nothing weird out here. But as soon as you go to polar coordinates, you start getting these weird extra, extra terms. Those are coming from the Christoffel connection coefficients, though I'm sure Pat Cole never told you as much. Okay? Or like. Leith? Okay. Blaith knows. Leith knows. He just spared you. Um, okay. Now, if you compare this to an e and book, you'll realize very quickly, though, that you get a different result. Because in the e and book, what you find is this expression, dr vr uh, plus 1 over r d theta v theta plus 1 over r uh, VR. Okay? So for I don't know what E and M book you guys have used, but um, usually the E and M books, if you look at the divergence of a vector in, in polar coordinates um, and you ignore the, the the phi terms, you'll get an expression that looks like this, which is obviously different in this term. Okay? And the reason for that difference is that the book you're looking at, and I know Griffiths does this, and maybe if you use a different book, he doesn't do that. Um, the book you're looking at is lazy because it should have technically said this. That is, it was actually expanding the vectors in a normalized basis. We are not using a normalized basis in this class. Remember, the basis of vectors in this class is given by the set of partial derivatives. And those are not normalized to 1. Okay? So to give you an idea of how this works and to show you that these are, in fact, the same thing, if you work in a normalized basis and you take, for example, the two radial ve basis vectors, then their dot product is 1. If you take the normalized theta vectors, then their dot product is 1. That's what working in a normalized basis means. In the coordinate adapted basis, which we use, the dot product of the two basis vectors along the r direction is 1. However, the dot product between the two basis vectors in the theta direction is actually r squared. Okay. But you can take this and you can actually infer a relationship. You can say that E hat of R is equal to E of R. Okay, there's really nothing different between, there's no, nothing different between these two. However, here we can say that E hat of theta is E of theta divided by R. And clearly you can see that if I take e theta dot e theta and I replace it with e theta over r and then e theta e theta is r squared and then that cancels the r squared. <coughs> okay. So now if I come down here and I say do 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 do, do 
Oh yeah, yeah. No, I'll just I'll just say this. This then implies that the r component of a vector is the same as the r hat component of a vector. So it doesn't matter for the r components whether you work in the coordinate basis or the normalized basis. But for the theta components, you get a factor of 1 over r. And now what you can do is you can literally take the, the hat versions of the vector components, plug them into here, and this expression will reduce to the expression in terms of the unhatted components. So that's, that is not something that we need to get too wrapped up with. I just want you to realize that you've, you have been doing this or will do this when you work with divergences and other vector calculus operations in ENM, because in ENM you use spherical polar coordinates all the time. Okay, You're really just taking into account these Christoffel connection coefficients. But the expressions look a little bit different in those books versus in, for example, Carroll, because you're using a coordinate basis versus a normalized basis. And one is not really any better than the other. Now, that is sort of a connection to something you've seen before, but it still doesn't make you feel good inside, right? Does anybody feel good? I don't feel good, man. It's been a shitty day. Now I'm going to make us feel good. Let's take our happy pill. Let's actually figure out what in the hell is going on with this derivative. And hopefully, moreover, what we can do with it. Now, while I'm erasing, I have to make a pitch. And it is by no means incumbent upon you to do it. But uh, how many of you know Gabriel? Gabriel is interviewing at Santa Barbara for a tenure track job this weekend. And he has to give two lectures. He's coming in this room as soon as this class is over and he's giving a demonstration of one of those lectures. It's a lecture on path integrals. So if any of you would be willing to stay as an audience, he would really appreciate it. I just wanted to throw that out there. I sat through a lecture last night on the fluid mechanics. Um, so I'll be here for the path integral lecture as well. Okay, so, um, so I would argue that if we wanted to ask, what is all of this machinery really telling us? I would say that del mu v nu is basically describing how v nu changes as we move around in space. So what we have in mind here is maybe we have a vector field. That is, at all points in space, there's a little vector at each point. And what we're trying to figure out is like if I start here and I see what the vector looks like here and then I move a little bit in some direction, what is the, how does the vector change as I move to another point? That's what a derivative tells us. Okay. However, what we have to be careful of is that, that that change can happen or manifest in different ways. So I'm going to draw a couple of comparative studies for you. Here's the first case. So what we're going to do is we're going to take two points in the space. And at those two points, we're going to, at each of those two points, we're going to construct a basis. And I'm just going to call the basis vectors E1 and E2. And then what we might discover is that at one point in the space, our vector points in this direction. But as we move to this point in space, we suddenly find the vector pointing in this direction. Okay? God, this is going to be hard. I can do this. I've got, got to summon some stuff here now. Okay, you can do this, Alex. What happened to the happy pill? <laughs> well, I, I spoke too soon. Actually, it's really not that hard if you do it right, but I think I usually don't do it remotely right.
Okay. So let me give you an illustration of what I'm trying to describe here. In both situations, if you squint your eyes and ignore everything that you see except for, and maybe we'll facilitate that with a different color, if you just focus on the black part and ignore all the other garbage in the pictures, I will ask the question, as I moved from this point to this point, did the vector change? I mean, here it's pointing like this, and up here it's pointing like that. Did it change? No. Yes. yes. <laughs> like, if this guy's driving to McDonald's, yeah. Yeah. this guy's driving to KFC. Yeah. yeah. Oh, so he's like between pictures. Not oh, you meant from here to here? No, I, I, that's why I said, as I move from this point to this point, yeah. does the vector change? Yes. As I move from this point to this point, does the vector change? Yes. No. Yes. Well, okay. Okay. I, I need for this vector to point in a different direction than that vector. Can we all agree upon that? Yes. Thank you. This would have been a longer lecture if you couldn't agree on it. Okay. Now I'm going to write down some very important things. In this version of the story, I have that the components of the vector changed. Notice, the component of the vector along E1 in this, at this point is different than the component of the vector along E1 at this point. Okay? D nu, V nu is asking the question, how do the components of the vectors change with respect to the basis at the point where I'm looking at it? Okay? Alternatively, gamma nu mu lambda V lambda the Christoffel connection is telling us whether the basis itself is changing as we move from this point to this point. Does the basis change in this case? No, it's the same basis. So in this case, this is zero. Over here, what we have is that the basis clearly changes because the basis rotates. But if I did it right, and this is where I was sweating it, if I did it right, the components of the vector in this basis should be the same as the components of the vector in this basis. So over here, d mu v lambda equals zero. Okay? Is there any particular reason you picked lambda instead of mu between the first two? Yeah, no, 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 no. It, yeah, uh, yeah, this should be a new. And this should be a new. Yeah, I'm just, yeah, okay, all right. Now, in, in both cases, in both cases, the vector changed. Covariant changing, the covariant derivative is the true derivative. It's literally what you get if you squint your eyes and just say, is the vector different there compared to there? The partial derivative is only half the story. Because, for example, you can have the components be the same, but if the basis is changing, then the vector is changing. So there's a sense in which the covariant derivative is really capturing whether the vector is changing or not. So to really put the nail in the coffin, let us consider two more examples, and these are probably going to be a little easier. So I'm going to take two points, I'm going to set up two bases. And then I have a second example where I pick two points, set up two bases, and this one's going to be hard. There's always one that's going to be hard. Oh, man. Oh, no, this one's actually going to be easy. Easy and hard. Those are relative things. You know, what's easy to me is hard. 
in general. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, okay. So here we go, here we go. Here's the cool part. Uh, so I haven't drawn the vector yet, so right now I'm just kind of setting up the machine. So here we go, here's a vector. And here's a vector. Okay, now the idea was for those to be the same. In this case, we notice that d nu v, d nu v nu is zero. The components don't change, but also the basis doesn't change. Well, altogether, that means that del nu v nu equals zero, and that's what we see. Okay? Coming over here, if I did it right, you'll notice the components changed and the basis changed. But the changes offset each other because if we squint our eyes and look at that vector, it didn't change. So the moral of the story is that the partial derivative part of a derivative, of a covariant derivative, is telling us how the components with respect to the basis change, whereas the Christoffel connection is actually telling us how the basis itself is changing as we move from point to point in the space. Okay. Yeah. Um, so why isn't the d mu, or sorry, just the, the regular partial, why is that not describing the torsion? Torsion? Yeah, because that's kind of what I thought torsion was. Was the partial derivative? Well, so the way that you're explaining that it's curvy. Oh, I guess because it's within the same plane that's not the same torsion. Uh, yeah, no, tor tor to actually geometrically describe torsion, you'll have a different, I, I can show you a picture that will geometrically tell you what torsion is. Okay. Um, but it's, it's not, it's not this for sure. All of the vector calculus that you've done has been in the context of a torsion free geometry. Like there's nothing that you've ever done with vectors which would say this is what torsion is. You've just never encountered it before. It's a really, really weird thing. Um, but there's a, there's a picture and I, I can't remember how it's defined but you basically, you go around a closed path that's defined to be closed in a certain way but when you actually get around the closed path you're not back where you started. But I, I would have to look up the details of that definition. But, but torsion is a very, very non-intuitive component to a geometry. And it hasn't arisen, I guarantee you, in, a, in any context that you've There are things which, I mean, twist. So there are things that we kind of think, I mean, the notion of the word torsion has a lot of you know, baggage that comes with it. But in the technical definition of torsion, the thing I got rid of in the connection, that's something that you haven't been working with in a geometry in any context that I'm aware of, okay, in the geometry. Um, all right, so any questions about this interpretation? Because now we're going to see what else we can get out of this really cool device. Okay, and by the way, you know, now is, now is where in pictures you can see where you've seen this before because exactly in spherical polar coordinates, when you think about the r hat and theta hat directions, those bases change as you move around the circle. That's why you need the Christoffel connections in polar coordinates because what? That's just, I'm excited. Oh, okay. Good. Yeah, all right. So, so that's, that's exactly, this is the formal machinery, but of course now you can do this with any set of coordinates. Like you can literally, I could give you a toroidal coordinate and a space with a metric and say, you know, what does the covariant derivative look like? And you can bang it out. You're not restricted to the simple formulas in your um, textbook. All right. So, there also turns out to be some really cool things we can do with this that are very, very important. Okay, so delta mu, the covariant derivative, is secretly telling us information about how we move vectors around in a space. That is, how do we reckon with the fact that the tangent spaces at different points are not actually aligned with each other necessarily? Okay. Um, to really put this 
on a concrete term, I want you to consider the formal definition of a derivative. So normally we would say that d mu v nu, evaluated at the point x mu, is the limit as epsilon mu goes to zero of v nu evaluated at x mu plus epsilon mu minus v nu evaluated at x mu all over epsilon mu. Okay, that's just the sort of higher number of dimension coordinate version of the vector definition that you learned in Calc 1. And, and all I want to do is I want to point out the fact that the derivative is really taking the value of the vector at one point in space and comparing it to the value of the vector at a different point in space. That's the spirit of a derivative. The problem, of course, is that in, in curved spaces, we've got to be really careful about moving vectors from one point to another because vectors live in tangent space and the tangent spaces change. So what we should really be thinking about, which is what we just developed, is del mu of v nu, evaluated at x mu. And it turns out that you give a very similar interpretation of this with one minor caveat. Mike, can you spot the difference? No, no, no. I, yeah, I know the left hand <laughs> sides are different. It's the right hand sides. Um, I mean, there is, a, there is one that's eroded. So. Good, good. You're, you're awake. Yeah. I, I'm so proud of you. Yeah, there's no, there's no difference right now. Here's the difference. Uh, okay. So, no, 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 it's, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make sense of this. So, um, so what, what the covariant derivative does for us that the ordinary partial derivative is too dumb to do is the covariant derivative says, look, if I want to compare a vector at one position to a vector at another position, I have to have a sensible way of moving the vector from one place to another. So what the covariant derivative is smart enough to do is it grabs the vector here and it moves it to this position in a very, very specific way that's called parallel transport. That's what the parallel lines mean. Okay. So this guy is parallel transported to the position x mu. Now, this guy and this guy are sitting at the same point. They're in the same tangent space, and then subtracting them totally makes sense. Okay? So what is parallel transport? Let me show you a picture of parallel transport. It's actually pretty straightforward. So um, the, the idea of it is that you move the vector and keep, as you move it, the vector parallel to itself. Okay, so let's take a path, and let's take some point, and then at this point we might have that, at that point the vector v mu, so this is the point x mu, and then up here we might have the point x mu plus epsilon mu, and at this point we might find that we have a vector like this. Okay. You'll see why I have dotted lines in just a minute. Okay. So I have the value of the vector field here, and I have the value of the vector field here. These are two different points in space-time. And then what I want to do is I want to parallel transport this vector down to this location. It's exactly like what you think. You just keep moving the vector down this path, and every, at every position you draw the vector parallel to itself.
So literally, you just keep your hands steady. Boom! There I am. Uh, it almost looks trivial, right? Don't worry, it's going to turn out to have some very interesting non-trivial consequences. But the important point is, is that once you've got that vector down here, it totally makes sense to subtract those two, because they're both vectors defined in the same tangent space. Okay? Now what's interesting about it is to make an interpretation of the covariant derivative, I have to introduce you to the notion of parallel transport. But what's cool is we get a formal definition of parallel transport from the covariant derivative. Okay? So let's see how that would work. Uh, suppose we want to parallel transport uh, a vector, v mu, along, and we don't necessarily have to do it along a straight line. We can pick any path. So let's just pick a curve. So as we are all aware, curves are parametrized, so x mu of lambda is some path through space-time. Now remember that if we want to talk about how something changes along a path, we were introduced to the directional derivative along the path, okay? This is something we worked with a little while ago in flat space, but now, noticing that it makes use of the partial derivative, we know it should actually get replaced by a more mature expression. So we now work with the covariant partial derivative, big D by D lambda, and you could probably guess the form that this takes, dx D lambda del mu instead of partial mu. Of course, the first term in del mu is just partial mu. So that's actually the normal definition of the directional derivative. So I can write over here that this starts out as d by d lambda, but then you get corrections from the Christoffel terms. Where the dot dot is there because I don't yet have this thing acting on something. Okay. So the directional derivative with respect to lambda is going to measure how something changes as we move along the path parameterized by lambda. And now here's the hundred gazillion dollar question that Avery is going to answer. If I want to parallel transport a vector along a path, what do you think I'm going to insist for the directional derivative of the vector along the path. <laughs> that what? No, you said it's torque-free. <laughs> you guys need to get off the torque and gravy train. So I want to keep the vector as unchanged as possible. What do I want the directional derivative of the vector to be? Zero. Yeah, that's what we mean when we talk about something not changing. Its derivative is not zero. Okay, so parallel transport of the vector v mu is imposed by saying that the directional derivative of v mu equals zero. Okay. <laughs> No, 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 you're fine. Okay? So let me, let me actually expand this a little bit because we know what the directional derivative is. It's actually acting on something now. So we can fill in what this looks like. So we have the ordinary directional derivative plus, and now we can put the relevant uh, indices on our Christoffel connection. So we have nu, mu, rho, uh, dx mu d lambda v rho, all of that equals to zero. Okay. 
And this is the mechanism by which we parallel transport vectors around a path parameterized by lambda. Okay? Now, in operation, let me give you a sense of what, how you use this. This is a differential equation. It's got a derivative in it. And don't get me wrong, like this derivative here is actually secretly this derivative, so it kind of blows up. These are 64 Christoffel connection components, so that's kind of ugly. There's a derivative there. It's a, it's a big nasty differential set of differential equations, but that's what it is. It's a set of differential equations. So what you can do is you can pick a point in the space, specify the vector that you want to start with, and then solve these differential equations. And that will tell you the components of the vector as you move along whatever path it is that's parameterized by lambda. Okay? And that's the unique parallel transport of that vector along that path. Okay, we, we, you're gonna do this in your homework, so if this, this, this methodology is not clear, you got a differential equation, if I want you to solve it, you need to give, you, give me a starting point, some boundary conditions, and then you solve the differential equation. And I won't make it you know, any more painful than absolutely necessary. Um, we can immediately can extend this definition to arbitrary tensors, because all we really need to know is how the covariant derivative acts on an arbitrary tensor, but we already know that from here. Okay. So in addition to parallel transporting vectors around the space, we can parallel transport arbitrary tensors around the space. Right. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to make three very quick comments and then turn the floor over to Gabriel. Gabriel, you, want, you can come get set up up here. You, go ahead. Come up here and get set up because I know you have a presentation. But I'm going to just finish with three quick comments. Yes, go ahead, Madison. So you drew like sort of a lambda as a straight line there, but if lambda was curved, how would we define something being sort of parallel? I'm going to, I'm going to, yes, what, okay. what part of what I'm about to show you. Okay. <laughs> so three um, really cool things about parallel transport. A, Duh. You can't take derivatives without parallel transport. Like taking a derivative, which remember, physics is interesting because things change. That means you want to work with derivatives. You have to have the notion of parallel transport in place to talk about derivatives. But more interesting, parallel transport can indicate curvature. So let's see an example. If we're in R2, which is flat, it's not curved. If I take a vector and I parallel transport it along a path, then I just literally keep the vector parallel to itself and nothing interesting happens. And in fact, if I close the path, and carry the vector all the way around. When it gets back to where it started, it's the same vector. Nothing weird. Okay. Now let's take a different curved space. If I take a curved space, and I take a vector, and I parallel transport it, well, let's just pick a path. Let's start with a path that goes like this, down to the equator. Okay. A vector has to live in the tangent space. So for example, it could be tangent to the path. And then as I parallel transport it, it has to remain parallel to itself as best it can. Now bear in mind, you can't poke out of the sphere. The vectors have to live in the tangent space to the sphere. So there's a sense in which they kind of have to do this. They can't do this, right? But now I can continue the path, again, keeping the vector parallel to itself. 
And then I can complete the path, again, keeping the vector parallel to itself. And what you find is, lo and behold, when you get back to your starting point, the vector is pointing in a different direction. Okay. The idea that parallel transporting vectors around closed path gives you a rotation of the vector is one way to measure the curvature that is enclosed by that path. It doesn't happen for all paths on a sphere. You can take something all the way around the equator and it won't change. Okay? But that's in some sense saying that the average curvature that you go, you're, you're passing through around the equator is zero, whereas this path does, is sensitive to non-zero curvature. We're going to use this idea, which by the way is intimately tied to something I'm going to talk about in Physics X on Monday, which is called holonomy. But we're going to use this idea to build our curvature invariant. But the last comment I'll make, which is going to be relevant for next time, is that parallel transport, and Gabriel will know this, is what we're going to use in our formal definition of geodesics. Geodesics are important in this class because they are going to take the role of Newton's second law. So F equals MA is going to get replaced by geodesic motion, but to define geodesic motion is going to require the machinery of parallel transport, and that's what we're going to talk about next time. Thanks, you guys. You got a question? Yeah, um, just briefly. Uh, yeah. We say that we want the vector to stay parallel to itself. Yes, as best we can. Is that the same as saying it has to stay parallel to the connection? Uh, well, I mean, at what direction does the connection point? I mean, it's, what's, it's not a tensor, it's a three index object, it's kind of... So, all right, and then I'll shut this down.